Hi everybody, my name's Andrew and today I'm driving a 2016 Audi Q5. More specifically, this is actually my new B8.5 generation Q5. Well, new to me anyway. And if you saw my garage update video at the start of this year, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but a lot's changed for me since then. And I'll talk about some of that today. But this is also going to be a return to my old form of in-depth vehicle reviews or walkarounds because I haven't actually done one of those since my all track days, which was when I first started this channel. And since I have another blue Volkswagen now, I figured why not bring that format back? So there's gonna be a lot more handheld shots. We're gonna go a lot of, over a lot more detail of this car today. And of course, we're gonna introduce it to the long-term test fleet formally and talk about why I'm here with this car. So let's go ahead and start on that. Starting with the exterior, this particular Q5 is a 2.0-liter Premium Plus tech package finished in scuba blue metallic. It's a facelift B8.5 model, which in the U.S. ran from 2013 to 2017. This particular one is a 2016, as mentioned before. There were not significant visual changes for the facelift. All facelift cars came with uh, xenon and LED combination headlights, LED taillights that were slightly different, and a slightly different front end. Mechanically, though, they are a little bit more different. With the facelift, Audi ditched the old 3.2 liter V6 in favor of three different engine choices. There's this 2 liter turbocharged four cylinder, a 3 liter supercharged V6, as seen in many other Audi products, and a 3 liter turbo diesel V6. Now, personally, I was actually looking to buy the TDI diesel version because it's just the coolest, let's be honest, for a, a car enthusiast. It's the most tunable, it's the fastest when you do so, and it's the most rare. But that's the biggest problem, it's the most rare. I just couldn't find a good deal on one, and this two liter example ticked the boxes that I was looking for apart from that, so I figured why not. And this two liter, although not fast, it does still produce a respectable zero to 60 time of roughly six seconds. It makes 220 horsepower and 258 foot-pounds of torque stock. It is tunable, as we've seen in the GTI and other models, but honestly, I really have no desire to tune this car, um, which sounds crazy, I know, but it just I just don't care, honestly, <laughs> with, this, with this kind of thing. It's not going to be a sports car, even if you give it 50 extra horsepower, so whatever. Um, and it's a little bit better on gas than the V6 as well. It's annoyingly requires premium fuel still. You can't run it on 87 like you can some of the newer... GTIs and other 2.0-liter Volkswagens, but it's a solid engine from what I've seen reliability-wise, and I really have no complaints, honestly. Around back, really the only major change with the facelift is the taillights, as mentioned before, and this little strip of chrome on the tailgate, which denotes that it is a premium plus or prestige trim. For some reason, that strip of chrome is not featured on the base premium trim. Speaking of trims, the 2.0-liter Q5 was available in Premium and Premium Plus. The tech package was available on the Premium Plus, which is what this car has. The 3.0-liter V6 and diesel V6 were both available in Premium Plus and Prestige trim levels. Although, to be honest, the feature content of the Premium Plus tech package is not significantly different than the Prestige. So, you're honestly really not losing that much. Several different wheel options were available, these being the 18-inch twin five-spoke design, and these are wrapped in 235 section all-season tires. Behind the power-operated tailgate, you'll find some of my random miscellaneous crap taking up the 29.1 cubic feet of cargo space. And if you fold the rear seat backs down, that expands to 57.3 cubic feet. Speaking of, you can do that from a handle on the bottom of the side of the seat, or from these quick release handles in the cargo area, which is my preferred method. Although, since the front seats are too far back, they don't actually fold all the way down right now. But they would, you get the idea. I also neglected to mention the fact that the rear seat does fold in a 40-20-40 configuration if you so desire. There's a button on the middle right here on the top of the seat that folds the center portion. And that gives you the ability to store longer items through the middle and carry people on either side. The rear seat backs also feature two different settings for the recline, although honestly they're not that drastically different from one another. Overall, rear space is above average for the segment, though bigger options like the Volvo XC60 are available. Interestingly, the new generation B9 Q5 
is slightly larger in terms of rear seat room and significantly smaller in terms of cargo space. Overall, this is not a bad back seat to be in. The seat is comfortable, it's a nice height off the ground so my legs aren't up in the air too much. The transmission and uh, drive shaft tunnel in the middle is quite pronounced, so sitting in the middle is not super comfortable. But this is my driving position here in the front seat and you can see I've got plenty of space for my legs and feet. So overall, nice back seat. You also have dual climate vents down here, a 12 volt cigarette lighter style charge port and you have a nice view of the panoramic roof as well. Before we hop in the front, this is what the key for the car looks like. It's the same key that Audi used on pretty much all the cars of this generation, and the same key design that was used on the Lamborghini Aventador up until just recently. Um, you will find keyless entry touch points on all four door handles, and the mirrors automatically fold when you lock the vehicle, which is a nice touch. Stepping in the front, the interior of this car is finished in pistachio beige with a contrasting sort of chocolate brown accent on the carpet and dashboard. You also have the brown wood trim in this car, which is my personal favorite. Again, the color combination of this car was really the main reason I bought this particular one. I actually had it transferred from a different dealership two hours away because of this color combination. And overall, this interior is holding up pretty well after 70,000 miles. There's a little bit of wear on the side of the seat right here, but that's really inevitable from getting in and out. Driver's seat features full power adjustment as well as four-way lumbar, which is nice. And the Premium Plus trim adds two-position memory for the driver's seat as well. Overall, the interior of this car has aged fairly well, I think, but the biggest drawback is really the technology. This being a 2016, it's now seven years old and the design in here came out basically 10 years ago now. Visually, it's fine, but from a usability point of view, it's pretty terrible, honestly. My biggest complaint is this screen right here. It does give you the option to scroll through a few different menus, but the way you do it is from three different places. <laughs> For one thing, on the side of the wiper stalk over here, you've got this button on the end, this button on the bottom, and then also these two buttons right here do basically the same thing as those buttons over there. <laughs> the main button on the bottom of the wiper stalk is what changes the main um, information that's being shown on there. You can see I'm scrolling through there now. The one on the end of the wiper stalk changes the bottom portion when you're on this screen, which you can cycle through your trip computer information basically from there. And this one over here, as far as I can tell, just pulls up the audio and phone menu. And then you can use the scroll wheel to move through that one. So really not great, if I'm honest. I mean, it shows you all the information you need, but getting there is kind of confusing at first. To the left of the steering wheel, you'll find the automatic light controls, and yes, it does have rear fog lights as well, which is neat. And on the door, you'll find heated mirrors, as well as the very difficult to turn dial for the power folding mirrors, as discussed previously. You can operate those at any given time, even while you're driving, which is neat. <laughs> And up here next to the mirror is the control for the blind spot monitoring system, turning that on and off. Not sure why they put it up there, but whatever. You may also notice the Bang & Olufsen speakers dotted around in here. This car features the 19 speaker B&O sound system upgrade as part of the tech package. It also features a 750 watt amplifier. It's a similar system to what I have in my B9S4, so I'm already pretty used to it. It's a good system, not the greatest, but it is really good. Although I'm not a professional, so this is just what I can hear with my ears. I don't have any testing equipment and I don't obsess over audio like some people do. My only complaint really with the sound system in this car is that unlike my S4, this one doesn't have a separate adjustable subwoofer. Moving the other direction on the dashboard, this six and a half inch infotainment screen is on the smaller side by today's standards, but still has nice graphics and is visually appealing. 
Unfortunately, despite being well within arm's reach, it is not a touch screen. It is exclusively controlled by the rotary dial and buttons surrounding it down here. This system is something that Audi's been doing forever, so I'm already used to it. It's easy to understand. My only complaint is that this dial spins backwards of how you would expect it to, uh, which some would argue is the correct way, but I'll, uh, I'll fight that. And also this menu button gets stuck down sometimes, but I really don't care about that. The other issue that I have with it is I really just wish it had Apple CarPlay. Other Volkswagen products got it in 2016, but most Audis didn't get it until 2018, unfortunately. It does have a backup camera and parking sensors, which of course isn't going to work right now when I'm trying to show you. That's going to be my first warranty claim with this car. Um, I bought it from CarMax, so it's got CarMax warranty for like 4,000 miles, and the backup camera only works maybe 75% of the time. The parking sensors do still work either way, but something is not quite right there electronically, so I'll get that looked at, but of course I can't show it to you right now. <laughs> the backup camera, though, unfortunately, is not super high res. Um, the colors are not great. It's just an older camera system, but it still does the job perfectly fine. Below the controls for the parking sensors, traction control, and hill descent control, you'll find the dual zone automatic climate control, which, much like a BMW, does not allow you to sync the two sides. You have three-stage heated seats in this car. The I believe the Prestige came with cooled seats or ventilated seats, so that is one thing you're missing there. But the climate control still is adequate, and there is a separate temperature adjustment for the rear seat that you may have seen before. My favorite quirk about the dashboard of the Q5 is this hole right here. This is actually an alternate method of starting the engine, because, of course, you do have the traditional push button down here. However, the pre-facelift cars didn't come with push to start, so you actually had to stick the key fob in this little slot right here with your foot on the brake to start the car. And as you can see, it still works in this one. Not sure why you would want to do that when you could just push the button, but you have the option there of doing so if you'd like. Three. Lastly, the passenger seat in the Q5 still features power adjustment, though is lacking the lumbar support of the driver's seat. You also have a rather large glove compartment on this side that is in fact cooled. There's an air vent back there and also features this phone connector. Uh, this is the only way to plug your phone in with a wired connection to this car. There is no USB port anywhere that I can find, and also this is only an Apple Lightning connector, so if you have an Android, tough shit, I guess. Um, that's really old school. <laughs> but, of course, it has Bluetooth, and why won't that shut? <sighs> so, what is the Q5 like to drive and live with so far? Well, I guess I should explain first how I ended up with this car. Um, as I alluded to in the beginning of the video, a lot has changed in my life since the beginning of the year. Um, for those that don't know, I grew up in North Carolina, mainly in the Apex and Pittsburgh areas just outside Raleigh. Uh, however, in April, I moved to Lynchburg, Virginia. This is a temporary move. I'll probably be moving back to North Carolina next year, but there were a few different reasons why I moved here. I'll discuss all that on the podcast with Mike eventually. Um, but my car situation changed a little bit due to the change in living situation. I'm in an apartment right now, and I really don't have a reason to have three cars anymore. And at the time of moving, I also just kind of needed the cash from uh, the i3 and the Baja. So I ended up selling the Baja privately through Facebook. Uh, I actually made four and a half grand on that car, but I'll talk about that on the podcast as well. And I ended up selling the i3 to Carvana, uh, which was just the easiest option because the logistics of actually getting it here to Lynchburg were really horrendous due to the range. Um, <laughs> that's an around town car. It's not a two and a half hour drive car. So. I'll actually have a whole video coming out on the i3 Carvana experience at some point soon. It may be before this one, it may be after that. This one, I don't know what order you're going to see these in, but anyway, if it is out, go watch it. <laughs> so 
My S4 is currently at the body shop getting fixed after its minor rear end collision from back in March. Yes, it's taken that long to get it fixed. And after it comes back from the body shop, I will be putting it up for sale as well. The Q5 exists primarily just to be my daily driver, uh, temporarily, possibly for the rest of the year. Um, I needed something that was a little bit less expensive than the S4 since I was going to be having both this and the S4 together for a period of time. Um, and this just kind of ticked all the boxes. It is super comfortable, it rides well, it's decent on gas. Um, it's an Audi, so it's got all the, you know, all the, all the German qualities that I like in a car. It's got decent features. You know, of course it doesn't have ultra modern technology like I'm used to, but it still has all the convenience features that you'd expect um, from a car these days. And it just kind of made sense. Ultimately, the goal I think is going to be to purchase some sort of dedicated sports car towards the end of the year um, and have this as my less expensive daily, which would allow me to spend a little bit more on that second car. But at the moment, this is what I'm rolling with just because it's actually kind of a smart financial decision for once, um, <laughs> which is rare for me, if you know me. But ultimately, this is what works for me right now, and it's a perfectly good car to drive in the meantime. Yes, it's not exciting, really. I mean, it sounds decent still as far as four cylinders go, and it's not horrendously slow, all things considered, but obviously it doesn't handle anything like the S4, and it's not going to be anywhere near as fast as that car. But as a daily, this is something I'm perfectly happy with. Um, it's This is just what it's going to be for a little while. It's what has to happen sometimes. I don't mean for that to sound too depressing. I'm not bankrupt or dying or anything like that. But I just had a change in financial priorities at the moment, which is something that I think a lot of people can relate to. And I'll miss the S4, but I am perfectly content driving this in the meantime. This is still a very nice car, obviously, and it's a great daily driver so far, just lacking a little bit in technology. But aside from that, great daily driver. So with that said, I'll talk more about all of this on the podcast with Mike at some point soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. But if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments about the Q5, leave them down below. As always, thanks for tuning in and consider subscribing for plenty more content with this car and others.